What's going on everyone? Drew from Enjoy Hoi Polloi here tonight with ideas to help you make better music, get it out, and get it heard. Tonight, I'm starting a new series, episode one of Squashed. Focus of this entire series is going to be exclusively on compressors and compression. What a compressor is, what's the history of it, how do you audio engineers use it, why is it important, what kind of instruments do you use on it, and what's the effect? Um, so I think to start off, we should address the kind of elephant in the room of what a compressor actually is. Okay, so effectively, a compressor is a tool that audio engineers use to control and change the dynamic range of a track. So when I'm talking about dynamic range, this is what I'm looking at. So here you see a waveform effectively. And this waveform has peaks and valleys, right? So just like a, a typical wave, uh, uh, peaks and troughs, right? Um, so the, the most, most of the time, the, the peaks are going to be the loudest portion on these tracks. And what a compressor does is actually makes those peaks slightly less loud in relation to the rest of the kind of ambient noise in the track or the ambient sound in the track. Compressors are used in a number of different ways, including, but not limited to, controlling the dynamic range, so the difference between the loudest and the softest parts of a song, uh, uh, a track, sound shaping, to change the way a sound actually hits your ear, um, so changing the overall, uh, overall characteristics of that sound's waveform, and then sound coloration, so to, to play with the you know, tone or timbre of a sound so that it's slightly different than what it was originally. Um, examples of this could include using uh, a compressor on drums uh, to, you know, for instance, make uh, the transient of a kick, the initial hit of a kick sound more punchy, or to put it on a snare drum to give the snare drum a little bit more body. Uh, other examples would be um, using compression on vocals to even out the you know relative levels throughout a, a vocal take. So for example, you know you may have a singer who gets real up close to the mic and really likes to be up in it, and then you may have someone who likes to get way far back or even further back and further back and further back, and you'll notice that. And I'm looking at this on Ableton the volume level of the, of the waveform goes down. Other ways that compressors can be used to be include, uh, you know, using it to glue a track together. So taking multiple different parts, applying a, a light glue compressor to them in order to stick those parts together so that they're more, co more cohesive and it sounds like one sound. I was looking up the history of compression and it was a little surprising to me because, you know, I figured that compressors were originally, uh, you know, used for music exclusively. Uh, but in fact, uh, the first compressors in the early 1930s and probably slightly earlier uh, were actually used in broadcast, so film, uh, radio, and television. And not getting into too many specifics on this because I'm not an expert in any way, shape, or form, but from what I understand, radio waves are effectively really long sine waves. Um, and in order to encode uh, you know, a sound or music to those sound waves, you have to actually modulate that wave. Um, and the, the, the challenge with doing this is that you can actually over-modulate that wave and create artifacts, effectively distorting or canceling out uh, the ability for that sound to, to be transmitted via the, the radio wave. So in order to solve this, early radio engineers started applying, uh, started running these, these, uh, uh, the sound through compressors. Um, and this had the benefit of effectively normalizing the gain levels on a track so that the louder sounds were relative, more, cl more closely aligned or more relative to the quietest sounds of a track. Um, and I will show you a waveform, something like that there. Uh, the first compressor was actually the Western Electric 110A uh, power limiting uh, uh, amplifier. And uh, again, exclusively used for radio and, and television and, and uh, film. And what happened is the smart engineers with good ears started to notice that it, in certain instances, it was actually changing the sound um, and making it either more punchy or cut through the mix better, et cetera, when they were applying it to music. So there was a logical transition from film and broadcast media to putting it into a studio, on some drums, on a bass guitar, on a vocal, and kind of the rest is history. 
So in the 1950s, they started to gain more popularity. So in the 1950s and the 1960s, you start seeing more uh, uh, studio-based commercial compression coming into play. Uh, companies like URA and UA uh, started creating things like the 1176, the LA-2A and the LA-3A, and other really famous, uh, well-known, overused probably at this point, uh, uh, hardware, hardware compressors. Um, and that actually leads me to the, the next part of this, and that is why did, why did it make sense to transition compressors from use in television and broadcast media into, into music? Well, they again, those smart engineers who were constantly riding the faders with vocals, trying to make sure the levels were you know similar and identical, noticed that they could actually save them quite a bit of time and energy to just slap a compressor or run it make it too easy to do this because we talk about VSTs, um, I, to, to run the audio through a compressor and then run it back into the board. And that way they didn't have to ride the faders as much with vocals. In addition, you see more punch to drums, more punch and cutting through and more tighter bass lines. Um, and overall, they started to develop different ways to work with compressors and use it effectively as a, uh, an audio effect, right? Um, so, over the next several decades, you actually start to develop things like, uh, the, the music industry started to develop terms like New York compression, rear bus compression, parallel compression, side chain compression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I will go into those in later videos. The other aspect that I think is relative is that compressors give you the ability to have slightly more headroom in a mix. So what you start to see in like the 1970s through the 90s, 90s, and now into the 2000s, are something that people term the loudness wars. And what is this? Okay. So effectively, decade after decade, you start to see increases in the overall um, uh, decibel level of each finished mastered track uh, and RMS levels as well, not just DBS, but uh, RMS, which is ratio mean square. And basically what that means is the overall loudness of these tracks starts to get closer and closer to the highest level possible. Um, this, this was an issue with uh, vinyl and with tape because with those physical medias, there was, uh, you know, physical analog medias, the, there was only a certain limit of volume that the tape or, or, or LP could handle before it, you know, the needle jumped out or the tape distorted. Uh, but what you get when you get into digital media like CDs and now MP3s um, is the, the concept of digital headroom, um, which is significantly higher than analog tape. Um, and over the years, especially from the 90s to now, you start seeing the, the, the headroom of these finished uh, mastered tracks start to be, you know, approach effectively zero, the null point. Um, and, you know, you start to see waveforms that go from, you know, these nice, even shapes, uh, you know, where you have a lot of dynamic range and a lot of high parts and a lot of lower parts and quieter parts uh, to effectively one gigantic solid bar of sound. Um, a lot of engineers feel like this overcompression is unnecessary, but you know when you're when you're publishing for streaming media, sometimes there's a necessity to have it. Um, so that's kind of it for the history of compression. Um, in the next series of videos, I'll go through what a compressor actually does, what are the controls of a compressor. Uh, some of the famous examples of compressors, like I mentioned, the 1176, the LA-2A, and LA-3A. I'll go through and talk about all of those. I'll also give you some background on how, you know, various, how some of these various techniques, like rear bus, uh, mixed bus compressing, uh, New York comp, things of that nature, how they work in, in dance music, um, and what they actually add to a track. So thanks again. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, give me a subscribe, click the like button, ring that bell, and I'll see you in the next one.